Hey guys, Katriana here, and I want to welcome you back to My Life His Way. As you know, the last couple of episodes, we have been going over the 28 Fundamental Beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which just so happens to be the denomination that I am a part of. So we've been going a little slowly, but we are down to the last 16 Fundamental Beliefs, and I want to just go over them Not quickly, but um, in short. So, you know what to do. Grab your Bibles, grab your notebooks, grab your pens and your highlighters, and let's dive in. So, in our last episode, we spoke about the church. That was the last uh, fundamental belief that we went over. Uh, Today, we're going to be on number 13, and it's the remnant and its mission going to be a little different today. We are not going to go over all of the verses. Um, We might go over some that are fundamental to the different uh, beliefs, and but as always, they will be in the description below each episode. Um, So let's get going. So number 13, the remnant and its mission. It says the universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ. But in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy, a remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour, proclaims salvation through Christ, and heralds the approach of his second advent. This proclamation is symbolized by the three angels' message of Revelation 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven and results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Every believer is called to have a personal part in this worldwide witness. So it makes sense. So it kind of, it goes with um, Matthew, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, I believe, where um, we are called to go out um, and teach right, to all nations, kindred, tribe, and people. Um, so that is our mission, not just as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but as his remnant, his children, as Christians. Number 14, unity in the body of Christ. Now that that's important, right? It says the church is one body with many members, called from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In Christ, we are a new creation. Distinctions of race, culture, learning, and nationality, and differences between high and low, rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive among us. We are all equal in Christ. (laughs) Let's read that again. We are all equal in Christ, who, by one spirit, has bonded us into one fellowship with him and with one another. We are to serve and be served without partiality or reservation. Through the revelation of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, we share the same faith and hope and reach out in one witness to all. This unity has its source in the oneness of the triune God who has adopted us as his children. Can I get an amen to that? So it doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter how much money we make. It doesn't matter where you're from, anything, nothing at all. We are to be united in Christ because he came um, and died for our sins and sacrificed his life for us, right? Um, We are all equal in God's eyes. Number 15, baptism. And this is an interesting one because different churches believe different things. So by baptism, we confess our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and testify of our death to sin and of our purpose to walk in newness of life. Thus, we acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior, become his people and are received as members by his church. Baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, and our reception of the Holy Spirit. 
It is by immersion in water and is contingent on an affirmation of faith in Jesus and evidence of repentance of sin. It follows instruction in the Holy Scriptures and acceptance in their teachings. So for this one, I do want to go to a verse. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts 2, 38. And that verse says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Number 16, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a participation in the emblems of the body and blood of Jesus as an expression of faith in him, our Lord and Savior. In this experience of communion, Christ is present to meet and strengthen his people. As we partake, we joyfully proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Preparation for for the supper includes self-examination, repentance, and confession. The master ordained the service of foot washing to signify renewed cleansing, to express a willingness to serve one another in Christ-like humility, and to unite the hearts in unite our hearts in love. The communion service is open to all believing Christians. Um, one of my favorite things about communion is it's a time where you can reflect on um, what God has done for you throughout that time period and time to even like if someone has wronged you or you've wronged someone it's a good time to clear those things up I remember my mom telling us a story of her and I think there was another mom there was like a conflict going on and they ended up missing communion service because they were outside and they were dealing with their conflict talking it out and there was forgiveness there was tears there was hugging you know but that that's what they needed to do in order to rededicate and prepare right um okay so that was the lord's supper that was number 16 number 17 spiritual gifts and ministries it's one of my favorite ones. So God bestows upon all members of his church in every age spiritual gifts that each member is to employ in loving ministry for the common good of the church and of humanity. Given by the agency of the Holy Spirit, who apportions to each member as he wills, the gifts provide all abilities and ministries needed by the church to fulfill its divinely ordained functions. According to the scriptures, these gifts include such ministries as faith, healing, prophecy, proclamation, teaching, administration, reconciliation, compassion, and self-sacrificing service, and charity for the help and encouragement of people. Some members are called of God and endowed by the Spirit for functions recognized by the church in pastoral, evangelistic, and teaching ministries particularly needed to equip the members for service to build up the church to spiritual maturity, and to foster unity of the faith and knowledge of God. When members employ these spiritual gifts as faithful stewards of God's varied grace, the church is protected from uh, the destructive influence of false doctrine, grows with a growth that is from God, and is built up in faith and love. So let's go. To we're gonna stay in Acts chapter six, verse one um, through seven talks about seven spirit-filled men, and it says, "And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of Grecians among the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration." Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, "It is not." It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and 
Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So, that's just one example, right? Number 18, the gift of prophecy. The scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. I think this is another important one because there are so many people who are like, oh, well, you guys have a prophet, you guys have Ellen White, and you guys take her word above the Bible. And Sister White even said herself that she is a lesser light um, and that her writings, that the writings that she she was given to share with with the people were not to be um looked at above the bible that the bible was still the the greater light okay and with anything that we read anything that we hear we should always go back to the bible to make sure that it aligns and if there's something that we read anywhere that does not align with the bible then we need to toss it or we need to we need to check our references always 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 cross reference number 19 the law of god the great principles of god's law are embodied in the 10 commandments and exemplified in the life of christ they express god's love will and purposes concerning human conduct and relationships and are binding upon all people in every age these precepts are the basis of god's covenant with his people and the standard in God's judgment. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, they point out sin and awaken sense and awaken a sense of need for a savior. Salvation is all of grace and not of works, and its fruit is obedience to the commandments. This obedience develops Christian character and results in a sense of well being. It is an evidence of our love for the Lord and our concern for our fellow human beings. The obedience of faith demonstrates the power of Christ to transform lives and therefore strengthens Christian witness. Amen. The law of God. Number 20. The Sabbath. The gracious creator, after the six days of creation, rested on the seventh day and instituted the Sabbath for all people as a memorial of creation. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law requires the observance of this seventh day Sabbath as the day of rest, worship, and ministry in harmony with the teaching and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of delightful communion with God and one another. It is a symbol of our redemption in Christ, a sign of our sanctification, a token of our allegiance, and a foretaste of our eternal future in God's kingdom. The Sabbath is God's perpetual sign of his eternal covenant between him and his people. Joyful observance of this holy time from evening to evening, sunset to sunset, is a celebration of God's creative and redemptive. And I know this is another controversial one amongst other denominations <laughs> um but there is uh there are quite a few verses and references uh for this one as well um we can just go to Luke chapter 4 verse 16 Luke 4 verse 16 says and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. 
And so this is when Jesus went home. He went to Nazareth and, and preached. And it doesn't say he went in on a Sunday. We can also read in the um, the story of when he was crucified, he he rested even then on the Sabbath and was resurrected up on a Sunday. Um, by by sunset on Friday, that Friday, he was laid in the tomb. So even even in that that experience, he still was able, which I always think is like pretty pretty cool. Uh, number twenty one. We're almost we're almost done, guys. Stewardship. We are God's stewards, entrusted by Him with time and opportunities, abilities and possessions, and the blessings of the earth and its resources. We are responsible to Him for their proper use. We acknowledge God's ownership by faithful service to Him and to our fellow human beings. And by returning tithe and giving offerings for the proclamation of his gospel and the support and growth of his church. Stewardship is a privilege given to us by God for nurture and love and the victory over selfishness and covetousness. Stewards rejoice in the blessings that come to others as a result of their faithfulness. Amen. Christian Behavior we are called to be a godly people who think, feel, and act in harmony with biblical principles in all as aspects of personal and social life. For the Spirit to recreate in us the character of our Lord, we involve ourselves only in those things that will produce Christ-like purity, health, and joy in our lives. This means that our amusement and entertainment should meet the highest standards of Christian taste and beauty. Along with adequate exercise and rest, we are to adopt the most healthful diet possible and abstain from the unclean foods identified in the scriptures. Sorry, I jumped um, a little bit um, uh, in the scriptures. Since alcoholic beverages, tobacco, and the irresponsible use of drugs and narcotics are harmful to our bodies, we are to abstain from them as well. Instead, we are to engage in whatever brings our thoughts and bodies into the discipline of Christ, who desires our wholesomeness, joy, and goodness. Number 23, Marriage and the Family. Marriage was divinely established in Edom, Eden and affirmed by Jesus to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman in loving companionship. For the Christian, a marriage commitment is to God as well as to the spouse and should be entered into only between a man and a woman who share a common faith. Mutual love, honor, respect, and responsibility are the fabric of this relationship, which is to reflect the love, sanctity, closeness, and permanence of the relationship between Christ and his church. Regarding divorce, Jesus taught, that the person who divorces a spouse except for fornication and marries another commits adultery. Although some family relationships may fall short of the ideal, a man and a woman who fully commit themselves to each other in Christ through marriage may achieve loving unity through the guidance of the Spirit and the nurture of the church. God blesses the family and intends that its members shall assist each other toward complete maturity. Increasing family closeness is one of the earmarks of the final gospel message. Parents are to bring up their children to love and obey the Lord. And by their example and their words, they are to teach them that Christ is a loving, tender, and caring guide who wants them to become members of his body, the family of God, which embraces both single and married persons. Amen to that. Number 24, Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. There is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle that the Lord set up and not humans. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. At his ascension, he was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry, which was typified by the work of the high priest in the holy place of the earthly sanctuary. 
1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry, which was typified by the work of the high priest in the most holy place of the earth, earthly sanctuary. It is a work of investigative judgment, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. Uh, in that typical service, the sanctuary was cleansed of the blood of animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things are purified with the perfect sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. The investigative judgment reveals to heavenly intelligences who among the dead are asleep in Christ and therefore in him are deemed worthy to have part in the first resurrection. It also makes manifest who among the living are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and in him, therefore, are ready for translation into his everlasting kingdom. This judgment vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus. It declares that those who have remained loyal to God shall receive the kingdom. The completion of this ministry of Christ will mark the close of human probation before the second advent. The Second Coming of Christ The Second Coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the Church, the grand climax of the Gospel. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When He returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected and together with the righteous living will be glorified and taken to heaven. But the unrighteous will die. The almost complete fulfillment of most lines of prophecy, together with the present condition of the world, indicates that Christ's coming is near. The time of that event has not been revealed, and we are therefore exhorted to be ready at all times. So no, there won't be a secret rapture. Someone's clothes won't be left there. While you guys are talking, you won't, you know, it's... It's going to be a, a glorious appearing. Amen. <laughs> okay, number 26 Death and Resurrection. We're on the home stretch here, guys. Plain and simple the wages of sin is death, but God, who alone is immortal, will grant eternal life to his redeemed. Until that day, death is an unconscious state for all people. When Christ, who is our life, appears, the resurrected righteous and the living righteous will be glorified and caught up to meet their Lord. The second resurrection, the resurrection of the unrighteous, will take place a thousand years later. So, again, in other churches, they teach that they their loved ones are in heaven or in hell or go to purgatory. But I feel like this is a lot more comforting knowing that... Um, no one is suffering in their death, that they are sleeping, and that when Jesus comes, families will be reunited, and um, the wrongs um, will, yeah, <laughs> the those who did not um, follow Christ or try or repent or uh, for their sins, you know, theirs theirs comes their day comes too. Uh, eventually. Number 27, the millennium and the end of sin. The millennium is the thousand-year reign of Christ with his saints in heaven between the first and second resurrections. During this time, the wicked dead will be judged. The earth will be utterly desolate without living human inhabitants, but occupied by Satan and his angels. At its close, Christ with his saints in the holy city will descend from heaven to earth. The unrighteous dead will then be resurrected, and with Satan and his angels will surround the city. But fire from God will consume them and cleanse the earth. The universe will thus be freed of sin and sinners forever. Um, let's go to Revelation chapter 20, verse, or Revelation 21, sorry. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. 
And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, and neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Whew, so encouraging. It's something to look forward to. Imagine no more pain, no more tears, no more heartache, no more losses. All that will be passed away will be in the earth made new in heaven with God and Jesus and the angels and just in in perfection. Number 28, the new earth. On the new earth in which righteousness dwells, God will provide an eternal home for the redeemed and a perfect environment for everlasting life, love, joy, and learning in his presence. For here, God himself will dwell with his people, and suffering and death will have passed away. The great controversy will be ended, and sin will be no more. All things animate and inanimate will declare that God is love, and he shall reign forever. Amen. Amen. That concludes our... 28 fundamental beliefs um i'll go through and so we started with the holy scriptures then we have the trinity the father the son and then we have the holy spirit number six was creation seven the nature of humanity next we had the great controversy number nine the life death and resurrection of Christ. Number 10, the experience of salvation. 11, growing in Christ. 12, the church. 13, the remnant and its mission. 14, unity in the body of Christ. 15, baptism. 16, the Lord's Supper. 17, spiritual gifts and ministries. 18, the gift of prophecy. 19, the law of God. 20, the Sabbath. 21, stewardship 22 christian behavior 23 marriage and the family 24 christ ministry in the heavenly sanctuary 25 the second coming of christ 26 death and resurrection 27 the millennium and the end of sin and last 28 the new earth now i pray that as we went through these uh, fundamental beliefs that whether you are a believer, whether you are a member of the Seventh day Adventist Church or not, that you were able to learn something new, um, that you gained some knowledge that you can share uh, with your friends, with your family. And even I pray that you, you will not just take these words, but that you will go back and, and study, study thyself to show yourself proved right um study the scriptures go through them one by one so that you will be able to uh, discern have discernment um for for these beliefs god bless and i can't wait to see you for our next topic